Steve, uh, let's talk about uh, the role that handball has played in your life. Handball has given me a certain reverence for living. It has brought me uh, places in the country which I would never have seen before, on the West Coast, the East Coast, North and South, and uh, I've met so many people and friends which I normally would not have come in contact with had it not been for handball. That's beautiful. Um, let's talk about when you played handball competitively, what did that mean to you? It brought a certain form of excitement within you, which made you play probably better than you normally would if it hadn't been for that desire to compete with someone who's trying to beat you. Great. Now, um, let's talk about the, the future of handball. There was a time when you first started, 1931, when a lot of people played handball. Today, far fewer people play the sport. What are your hopes for the future of handball? True enough, uh, way back in the, when I started to play, there were so, many, so few sports that were available to the young man growing up into business. So handball was a, play a big part in our lives. The YMCA had courts, and we would just naturally gravitate to the YMCA because there was no other sport available within our means. Talk about the early days of the YMCA. When did handball first start at the Y's? I don't have the factual information with me. Uh, the handball uh, at the Y in tournament play started in 1926. The AU had, had handball it started tournaments back in 1919. The Y had courts way back in the early 1900s because they want to take care of the young man and get him, get him, get him some action. Why did the Y select the sport of handball to be in all the YMCA's? Uh, it was a matter of uh, practical costs. Uh, they would uh, construct their courts within available space. They were not uniformly uh, uniform in length or dimensions. Wherever they had space, they'd put in handball courts. And that proved to be an outlet for the young man to do something who could not do another sport. Now, um, let's talk about some of the great players that you've known over the years. Well, that goes back, uh, I don't think I can dwell too much on the old time players that I recall, uh, like, Atchison, Plattick. Talk about Joe Plattick for a minute. Joe Plattick, in his day, I thought, was the greatest. What made him so great? It was because of his tenacity and the fact that he could use both hands equally as well. Did you ever see him play? I saw him play, never played against him, yes. How about uh, uh, Plakin, Walter Plakin from Buffalo? Plakin was a sharp player, a very brisk player, and uh, he, he would give his all. And I, he was a very good friend of mine, and I was glad that we got him into the Hall of Fame before he passed on. And what about Al Banuay? Did you have any contact with him? Uh, only what I know uh, and read, I met Al before he passed on, uh, after his playing days. They say he was a whiz, a wonder. Played with a lot of gloves, taped his fingers, and was a joy to behold. He played in Minneapolis in 1931. That was the last time he played in the tournament because afterwards he got into boxing and AAU barred him from, from the amateur sport. What did you think of that decision? Saying to Al, you, you became a boxer, and even though you only boxed two or three times, we don't want you in handball anymore. I was always felt that that was a little too stringent a rule because handball, in my opinion, and from what I've gotten from the game, is one which helps your well-being. 
and there's not one from which would uh, promote much finance. Okay. Uh, now talk about your friend George Quam, who was a one-armed handball player. George Quam lost his left arm in a railroad accident. He started to play handball in a YMCA secretary told him to try a game like ping pong because he had just one arm. That spurred George on and he became he, he became one of the great players. Uh, he joined the athletic club in Minneapolis and won the singles championship 25 years in a row and in 1950 they asked him to to retire from competition to give others a chance. So uh, he did, and in 1954, when I joined the club, I took over and won 15 years of handball, uh, following his record. Since then, uh, the players have improved so much that there's no one who dominates handball there at the club now, as George did, and as I was lucky to do. Talk about the, the personality that, that George would have uh, that George had to have in order to overcome the deficiency of, of not having one hand and yet becoming a great champion. What was it about George Quam that made him so tenacious? George was a very reverent man and uh, a believer in, in God and uh, he felt that he only had one arm to concentrate on and in his opinion his own opinion was that he had no worries of what arm to use and that spurred him on to great heights. That's great. Doug, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I think that, that's pretty good coverage. Yeah. That's I've great. had uh, many friends that uh, I wouldn't have known if I hadn't been for handball. I don't think I would be in, in such good health if I hadn't played handball. I've known the past champions and current champions. I think you've talked to some of the current ones, uh, uh, Vic Hershkowitz, Phil Collins. Steve, here's what I'd like you to do. I, I'd, I'd like you to do that over again, but give your age first. Say, I'm 80. Well, I'm past the strong playing uh, years. Uh, at 82 years of age, uh, I'm fortunate that I can get on a court three times a week. I love to play and I just enjoy being with handball champions and, and just seeing them play. I, I know something I'd like to ask sort of along this line, Steve. Um, there's something about this game as I've watched it and worked with Ben that really impresses me and that is how people who are in handball are all very down to earth in a way. I mean, there's some colorful characters, but my main point is how many sports are there where somebody could come and meet the champion of the sport and maybe have lunch with them and talk handball with them? The way in which it's a very democratic game and everybody gets along, that's very unique in sports. If you could tell, talk to Ben, though. Well, it's the handball is a fraternity of players. No, you, you have to be looking at me. Just tell you what, back. why don't I take, take your seat, Ben, and do that. Yeah. Handball is a fraternity, in my opinion. The players are seem to be a brotherhood. It's not like a, another sport where, where finance is so important. In our game, friendship and fraternity is the key. But you know, it's a game where you really, it's you against the other guy, and it's a tough, tough game when you're on the court. I mean, you, there's, you know, somebody may be hindering you a little more than they should, or somebody hits you with the ball. It's almost like a physical boxing type of sport, and yet there's this fraternity. How could a, such an aggressive sport lead to that kind of friendship? I believe that, I, I'll speak for myself, and I know other players too, they feel that they should give the other man a chance as well at the shot. And that feeling has gotten into the rules of the game. 
So now the rules tend towards that too, to give everyone a fair chance to hit the ball. And we feel that way uh, against our opponent. And there's a code of honor about that? The, distinctly, uh, a code which is maintained by the players all the time. Code of honor is a good way to say it, I'd say. Can you tell me a little more about what that means? Could you start off by saying, well, there's a code of honor in the sport and, you know, talk about both the hindering side and also just the side to, you know, not call double bounces and... Hold on for one second. That thing just clicked in. I want to wait. It goes through these cycles and it gets really annoying. It's going to be about uh, five minutes, Paul. We're almost there, Paul. This is the last question. <laughs> He's due. He's due. He's chilling some beer for you. I'll be right out to get you. <laughs> Let's see. Stop. Well, we'll go with it. Okay. Uh, a referee can't pick up all the infractions. So there's a little code of honor there where if we know that we've, we've taken on double bounce, we, we acknowledge it. And if you know we got a wrist ball and the referee cannot catch it, we call it on ourselves. That's the spirit of the game. And does that continue off the court? It continues off the court in many more ways. Yes, it does. Right. Can you describe some of those? Right. In, in, in the, just the fraternal aspects of, of meeting afterwards and discussing our game, discussing other games, and just talking. Does Very uh, a friendly way. There's a lot of angles to this game to talk about. Many angles, yes sir. You were instrumental in the forming of the United States Handball Association with Bob Kendler. Could you tell us something about how that came about? Well, I was the uh, AEU singles champion in 1950. And uh, as a result, I was working for Mr. Kendler. I was associated with him. And at that time, we felt it was a good time to branch off into our own organization. And that's when we formed the USHA. Because Bob, at that time, uh, had people in his organization who were handball players. And since I was the national champ, he felt it was a good opportunity to form the USHA because you had the top players in our organization that would go with us. Who were some of the players uh, who you were uh my contemporaries were Gus Lewis, Lee Kershkowitz, Plakin, Walter Plakin, and Bob Brady. The five of us, for about five years, we competed among ourselves for the top honor. Tell me about Bob Brady. What do you remember of him? Well, Bob Brady was a policeman, if I recall, from San Francisco. Very aggressive player and uh, a good player. Uh, I played against him several times, and uh, as I recall, I think I beat him most of the time, except for the last time in 1951 or 52. This was in the semifinals, and after that match, I decided it was time to give up singles, and I went into the doubles tournament. I beat him the first game rather badly. Uh, we had a tough game the second game, and I ran out of gas, and I figured that it was time for me to give up my singles activity. And how old, how old were you then? Uh, at that time I was oh, about 33, 34. Talk about Bob Kendler. What do you remember about Bob Kendler? Well, Bob Kendler, if anybody could be called the father of handball. Before Bob Kendler came on the scene, it was controlled by the AAU. And the AAU treated it as a stepchild. Bob became uh, infatuated with handball and when he formed the USHA, <clears throat> it really grew. He made all the innovations that we now enjoy. He standardized the courts. From, uh, we used to plan courts that were anywhere from 25 to 50, wooden walls, wire mesh ceilings. He standard to 20 by 40, and that's where all the tournaments were played, and everybody adjusted their courts accordingly. So when, uh, when Bob Kender was putting together uh, courts. Uh, he also built handball courts, did he not? No, he didn't. Oh, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he was a, a builder. A builder. But, but not a handball court. Homes. Right. Um, I, I thought he had owned some clubs or some... Well, 
<laughs> you can cut this off right now. Give me a chance to from the town club. Right. We need to start at the again. Sheridan Hotel in Chicago. It was the old Medina Club. It occupied four floors of the Sheraton Hotel on Michigan Boulevard. Okay. And that's where the town club was formed. I'm sorry, could you start that again? <coughs> Actually, that, that's not information that, that okay. we Okay, all right. Um, <coughs> I, I want to... Uh, Hold on uh, just a minute, I got it. Sure. Well, I, I don't think that's affecting it. Okay, uh, Ken, when Bob Kendler tried to put handball on television back in the 50s, I believe it was, do you recall anything about the, that era, how it was received, what happened? Well, the first uh, time we had television was when I was defending my championship. Uh, no, not, that's not true. It was in Detroit. I was runner-up. And uh, I remember playing in Detroit, and what they did was they televised it only in Chicago. It was not nationwide. He had made some arrangements where even though the uh, play was in Detroit, it would be televised back into Chicago. And that's the first time they televised it. And it was very difficult to follow the ball. And if you did not know the game of handball, you would have no interest whatsoever in watching it. And were, pre, uh, were su successive attempts at handball any more successful than that? Do you recall the, the evolution of handball with Bob Kendler, Bob Kendler's efforts to put it on television? I don't think that had too big an effect on uh, the growth of handball. I think the fact that uh, word of mouth got around that Bob was running some fantastic tournaments, the hospitality was uh, unreal. He would raise a tremendous amount of money to run a tournament. And uh, at that time, as they say, the town club was the mecca of handball in Chicago. And uh, he would uh, wine and dine these uh, players from all over the country. And he would raise an, enough money so that he could have fantastic hospitality, entertainment. In fact, one year. We had Sammy Davis Jr. perform for us. Uh, he was at the Shapery at the time. And I guess word of mouth got around and uh, people began coming to the tournament because it was a, a vacation to a great extent. And that's what, in my opinion, uh, increased the, uh, uh, the growth of handball. Eventually, handball's fortunes changed and you were there to watch it change. It went from a sport that was relatively popular to a sport that was on the decline. What took place to have that happen? Well, for one thing, they introduced junior handball, and they start supporting junior tournaments, college tournaments. We start getting some of the youth involved, and that was something that was lacking years ago, because years ago, the youngsters were not allowed to play on the handball courts. We had so few football handball courts that the uh, adults uh, would want them on the course because they didn't have enough time for them to play the tar the the, uh, the game. But uh, with the advent of uh, the juniors and the, and the uh, college uh, increase in activity, we start getting younger players, and that's where the growth began. Now, since then, we've seen a decline in the numbers of handball players. What can you attribute that to? I disagree with you. I don't think there has been a decline. I think there has been a plateau, and in my opinion, it'll always be a plateau because it's a very strenuous game, it's a very tough game to learn, and you have to be to a certain extent dedicated, ambidextrous to a great extent, and a lot of kids who start playing it find it too difficult because their hands hurt, and they get discouraged, and, uh, but basically uh, those who are interested in a good workout, and usually father-son activity, uh, will uh, induce the children to uh, compete, uh, but I think it's a plateau, not a decline. Talk about the, the formation of the Pro Tour. What do you remember about that? Well, I'm not too familiar with the Pro Tour because when I was National Commissioner, I opposed it most of the time. I just felt that if any uh, money was going to be raised, it should be raised for the amateurs. But there was a demand, a, a cry for uh, a display of some of the top players, and they start uh, checking with some of the people who are going to sponsor, some of the organizations who are going to sponsor the tour. And some of the clubs were interested in sponsoring with a uh, cash outlay of about five or six thousand dollars, and we decided to try to uh, uh, work it through the USHA, and it became rather successful. And the top players were going into the Pro Tour. They were making at that time maybe the top player fifteen hundred dollars for the victory, and it's been increased since. 
and I guess it's become one of the uh, uh, enjoyments of people who want to watch te a good tele a good uh, handball. Do you see the Pro Tour as having helped to spread the word of the game? I guess nowadays you could say yes. I would say yes. I see that uh, maybe uh, more people became involved because they wanted to see some great players competing against each other without going through a whole week of elimination. So they have it shortened to a period of uh, maybe two or three days. They get the top players and they see them right away without spending a whole week uh, waiting to see the top players compete. What was, what did you get out of handball? I got out of handball, that's a good question. Uh, the perks I received was great, great friendships, the ability to travel all over the United States. Uh, Health-wise, I think it helped me considerably. I enjoy the competition, and uh, it just was it become a part of my life. As you look back now on the years that you spent in handball, what was uh, what gave you the most satisfaction? The ability to travel, uh, to uh, keep healthy and fit, and uh, meet some great people throughout the United States. Doug, did you have anything that you'd like to add to that? Well, maybe if we can ask Ken about the atmosphere when he was growing up in New York. That's the question I always try to go for. You, you've heard me say it by now, Ben, so why don't you? Good. Okay. Uh, yes, growing up in New York, playing handball there, what, what in fact was the atmosphere like? Well, I grew up in New York, as I mentioned. I lived in the Bronx, and as if you lived in New York, handball was the national sport. You bought a five-cent pinky ball, and you used this ball wherever you went. You carried it with you, and you played ball against a, any building that you would find. Schools had teams. In fact, I played with the uh, James Monroe High School, which was my high school, and we had a handball team, and uh, we competed against other high schools. When they built parks in New York, one of the first things they built was maybe 15, 20 handball courts. But of course, when we speak of handball in New York at the time, it was one wall. It was just a front wall. I was fortunate. I was brought up in the East Bronx, and I attended as a youngster a place called Castle Hill Beatty Park. At that park, they had a tremendous amount of uh, athletic activity, including four four-wall handball courts.